Thank you for joining us for Women Empowered Live, where we gather weekly to explore principles of self-defense and how we can apply them uh, to face life's greatest challenges. Yeah, I'm Victoria Gracie. And I'm Eve Gracie. And we are so excited to have you here. Thanks for joining us. All right, so today we're really gonna dive into what we consider the self-defense mindset. And uh, in order to do that, we are gonna start with the most traditional form of self-defense, which is really what everyone thinks of when they think of self-defense. And I think when we think of self-defense, we think of defending ourselves against a physical threat. And everyone can get behind that, right? That is what, uh, that is what we teach. Uh, that is what the Women Empowered program and really Gracie Jiu-Jitsu was founded on, right, is this idea of self-defense. And so, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna dive into some of the tools and the principles um, regarding self-defense in this traditional form, right, of, of again, physical self-defense, defending ourselves against somebody who means us harm. But then we're gonna take it one step further, we're gonna go a little deeper and see how we can apply these same principles and the same mindset to other areas of life and how that translates. Yeah, and I think, I think it's important to make a distinction between these techniques for the scenarios and then the mindsets and how those can really drizzle into all these other areas that we're excited to share with you today. So. Let's yeah. just get into it. Let's go into it. So when we talk about the tools, right, <clears throat> self-defense tools, um, again, each of these tools, we could literally do an hour talk on each one of these, right? So we're going to kind of... Which we might. We might at some point. <laughs> um, but right now, we're going to kind of touch on them. And I think most people can get behind these, these uh, again, these tools or may maybe even understand um, a general idea of how they can be applied for self-defense situations. The first one is the awareness, right, awareness principles. And I think everyone has heard this when it comes to self-defense, just this idea of being aware of your surroundings, being able to identify a threat, a potential threat, um, and being almost willing to identify that. And I think that without, you know, again, making it too much of just like a blanket statement of just be aware all the time, right? I think that there are some interesting things that, that go along with why some people feel like they can't, they are, are, are more aware than others or, or have this kind of heightened awareness. Or hypervigilant in general. Like, right. I think a lot of us also have life experiences that have made us even more hypervigilant Absolutely. in our awareness and understanding of our surroundings as well as our normal come and go. We see people who do things each way and we're like, yeah, I'm gonna keep an eye on that person. Right, I think that there's, yeah, there's probably two reasons why let's say somebody may, may not feel like they um, are as aware as perhaps they could they could be or feel like maybe they, they want to be. I think one of those is life experience. It's this idea that like, oh, I live in a safe neighborhood. Yep. I, you know, nothing bad has ever happened to me. Things like that don't really happen. So their awareness level might not be where, like you said, somebody else with life experience of saying, no, threats do exist out there and I just need to be aware of what those look like. So that might be one reason why people don't have that kind of, um, you know, that inherent awareness principle down. The other, I think, is that, and this is a little bit deeper, but it's interesting, and I, I realized this once I embarked on my self-defense journey, that I think it is a difficult, it's difficult to face something that you don't feel prepared for. If you don't have the tools, why go into it? A and You're not so, gonna build a house without your hammers and your nails. Yeah, and I think that when it comes to, to awareness, I think that we are gonna, we are more likely to be aware if we also have an idea or a plan as to what we would do if what we're aware about, meaning this potential threat, were to happen. And this comes into just how a lot of people cope, which is like denial, right? So if there's a threat right in front of you, but you're like, I can't handle that right now, you're just like, oh, it doesn't exist, not a problem. Uh, yep, I'm just gonna keep going this way and not acknowledge the threats around us because it's almost overwhelming to even think about how to address them. And, and so it's interesting how once somebody becomes well-versed in self-defense, techniques and th these other principles that we're going to talk about, you are actually more likely to just have this, this uh, kind of an overall awareness of your surroundings because you have kind of looked at each of those potential scenarios. You have been yeah. there in your mind before and it's not even in this like paranoid way. It's just in like, oh, okay, I could see how that could become this <laughs> or that could become a problem or that could be a potential threat. And, uh, and just having that, that you know, solid background and feeling like you would know what to do if something happened, 
will allow you to feel more aware of your surroundings. Yeah, and I wanna give a little empathy to the idea that we are inundated with either news, social media, and information and friends on like, the negative stories that have happened. Oh, my friend, she got robbed at a liquor store, or I saw a woman get kidnapped on Instagram. And all these news stories can be an overwhelming sense of lack of safety in our life. And that that feeling of fear mm -hmm. can really take over yourself. So it's not wrong to go into denial or to detachment, to have these coping mechanisms to be like, I don't wanna be aware of those things. But it is important to know that having knowledge of, oh wow, that kidnapping happen in these kinds of ways. I can be hyper vigilant on knowing that I'm not gonna go to my car by myself with my kids in a dark alley without the light over. I would maybe ask for an escort out. So when we talk about this hyper awareness, that doesn't mean that you know it's wrong for you to have these coping mechanisms to not wanna know about these things. It is a protective measure in itself, which we'll get to in, in, in further into the talk right now, but it is important for you to recognize that the knowledge that you have of how situations go down, where you are, and understanding that you have tools to get out of it, this awareness principle can be a life-saving tool. And that, coupled with our next one, which is intuition. Hold on, sorry, before yes. we go there, yeah. I just say one more thing about it. <laughs> tell me, tell me. <laughs> which is also, I think that, uh, again, when we, when we talk about awareness, it can feel overwhelming. When we just say, sorry women, you have to be aware uh, all the time, You're every blame. day of your life, right? <laughs> this is your job, just be aware and nothing will happen. That is a very oversimplified version of heavy. what this is. And it's heavy, it's putting the, this responsibility on us of like, great, now I have to be, you know, ready to fight anyone at any moment. And that's not what we're saying and that's not what we're exploring. And, and we talk about it in the context of um, the, the tri triangle of victimization, which is basically this recognition that in order for something potentially bad to happen or for something violent to happen against you, there has to mainly be an opportunity, right? A predator, a target, and an opportunity. That opportunity is what we're training ourselves to say, hmm, is this a prime opportunity for someone to maybe take advantage of this because there might not be bystanders around? Sure. So we're, we're always looking for those, but we also don't want to feel this overwhelming weight of I have to you know, go around every single day defending myself from every single thing. So it's this kind of balance of knowing like, and this is where it comes into the next one, right? Yes. So the next one is intuition. Oh, and intuition. intuition is so important because all of our lives we have a bodily understanding. We're animalistic by nature, mm. primal. Our body knows energetically when things start to turn south, when the lights start to dim, when noises start to happen, that we're going, this doesn't feel right. Mm. And when our body responds that way, what have our parents told us since we were little? It's okay, it's okay, you're okay, we're okay. And we have mm. also been somewhat groomed into denying our body's natural instincts. This goes into family members and different things that could happen. We're like, he's fine, he's just your uncle. And you're like, he's creepy. So mm. all of these intuitive measures, we want to lean into this. We want to get back in touch with what intuitively we do know so that when stuff starts to make red flags or signal internal alarms, we can actually be in touch with that and go, where is this an actual fact and figure that I should be aware of? And where is this a previous potential trigger that intuitively I'm touching uh, in, in bodily response to. Mm, yeah, great point. And it, it's, it's just so amazing. Like intuition is this incredible thing that like, when you Magic. really think about it, it is, it's like a superpower. It really is. And, and many people have this ability and specifically, I mean, many women, like, again, this is a primal thing that when you're protecting your, you know, your child, like you have these like abilities to just like these spidey senses of, of sensing danger. Yeah. But like Victoria said, we have these inherently in us but because potentially, not for everyone, but sure. for many people, their uh, their intuition has been dampened over many years. And that looks like, you know, that comes in the form of, oh, you're overreacting, or don't make such a big deal, or don't make such a scene, or all of these things that make you question your intuition. Yeah. So this is when you go, okay, at the core of self-defense is, and if you, I encourage everyone to read The Gift of Fear by Gavin DeBecker, but this is a gift, the idea that our bodies have this sense of like, this doesn't feel right, or yeah. that pit in your stomach, or whatever that looks like for you, that is a gift given to us where we go, I gotta, I gotta trust that. And so getting back in touch with our intuition and trusting our intuition is a huge part of self-defense. And, and that's just even asking yourself, why does this person keep making me feel weird things in my belly? Not like the good butterflies, where sure. they're like, oh, he's cute. But like, right. there's something about him that keeps making me feel unease. I need to explore that feeling more, not necessarily explore that person more. Does that make sense? So it's it's getting back in touch with our intuition and really honoring, wow, you feel fear here, why? 
and ask yourself, is this a previous experience that's coming back up again that's unresolved, mm -hmm. unprocessed, unhealed? Or is this something new that I'm trying to ignore because all my friends think he's cool? Oh, because he's a coworker, so he should be safe. Or because mm -hmm. he's my boss, an authority figure, so I, I want to like him and I also want to do well at work. So you have to ask yourself, am I justifying my intuitive downplaying by other reasons because I want it to be better? So good. So the next tool is distance management. And this is one that we preach all day, every day in Grace's Jiu Jitsu. And it's like such a, it's a, such an important principle. And I think there's a, one side of this that everyone gets behind and goes, oh yeah, that makes total sense. If you can just get away from somebody, great. Right? <laughs> like, if you can manage distance and stay Run. away from somebody who is potentially trying to hurt you, that seems like we can all get behind that. So run, right? If you can, <laughs> run, get distance. Yeah. And we talk about this safe distance of punch protection being at least two arm lengths away from somebody. Um, so this idea of all the way out is understood. Now there's a diff another distance that we talk about in, in jujitsu, which is considered a safe di distance if you have the tools to keep yourself safe from there, and that's all the way in, right? So that's where, uh, again, distance management in, in, the, in the context of women empowered, in context of grace jujitsu, um, really has two distances that we consider safe, all the way out or all the way in, meaning you're so close to somebody that they cannot effectively strike you, you know, from an effective distance, a knockout blow. And obviously that takes some knowledge of what to do from that close distance. Um, and that's where, you know, jujitsu comes into play or the Women in Power program comes into play. But just this principle, and it's such an interesting one because we, even though this, even the, the distance, right, seems um, common sense, it may not actually be common practice and, and people may not feel like just this idea of, you know, stepping back and keeping yourself safe from someone and saying, you know, I don't really know what their, you know, what their, what their intention is. So let me assess this from a safe distance or let me just, you know, cross the street if I feel unsafe or whatever that looks like. So distance management, super important principle and one that is explored more in the actual techniques and, and, uh, you know, and, uh, lessons of women empowered and grace jiu-jitsu yeah and another tool after this is that we believe heavily in is verbal assertiveness and this is the idea that we are willing to speak up and voice our opinion to ask for distance if we need to to back up to hey stop bugging me to hey somebody help me so hey look over here something's happening so verbal assertiveness assertiveness comes from the idea that you can vocalize something you want and create a verbal distance from somebody. You can really create that distance management she's talking about. Yes, I can run away or I can say, hey, back up and make him or her honor the idea that I need space from you. You're freaking me out. You're weirding me out. I don't want this. And verbal assertiveness is hard and sometimes counterintuitive for many of us mm -hmm. because we were taught, at least in my generation, about being a good girl. And part of being a good girl was speaking a certain way. Not causing a scene. Yes, acquiescing to the, to, the, to the general moment and the people around me. And the difficulty with this belief system and us being raised under the idea of being a good girl is that we feel like if we cause a scene, we're bad. So it will supersede our want to then be verbally assertive. And that is a difficult stance to have. Mm -hmm. And that's one that you have to look at in yourself and say, why? Do I, have, do I have challenges asserting myself verbally with others? And, and even in the context of this self-defense, like we said, and we practice this, we actually know how difficult it can be yeah. for people to find their voice. So this is something that in Women Empowered, we practice putting your hands up, stepping back in base, and basically telling somebody to stop right where they are or whatever you need to communicate to them verbally to assert your boundary, which is next. Okay, so boundary setting. And this kind of goes hand in hand, but I think there's different ways to set boundaries and verbal assertiveness is part of that. So they're kind of tied in, but they almost deserve their own thing because finding your voice is one part of that. Setting a boundary is, um, can be done in different ways, yeah. right? So part of that is the physical boundary that we talked about, which is keeping just physical distance and saying, you know what, someone's too close to me and this has crossed my, my boundaries of what I'm willing to accept, the behaviors I'm willing to accept. And so then what, what do I do to protect, to protect and stand for those boundaries? Yeah. Um, and, and we've always believed that, and I, I firmly believe this because I have felt this, uh, you know, at, at my core throughout my training, but we are likely only going to set boundaries that we feel capable of defending. And that's an important thing to consider because 
again, this kind of goes back to that awareness of, of why we may, we may decide not to be aware, but why we may not set a boundary. Because if I say, don't come any closer, and then they come a step closer and we go, well, I got nothing. I joked. Uh, I, yeah. don't know. <laughs> I, I, I don't know what to do now. Yeah. It's, it feels, it's harder to say that with, uh, you know, the in, intention behind it that we need, right? And the conviction behind that of, no, I'm going to set a boundary. And if you cross that boundary, I have a, I have a tool to follow up with. And yeah. so, uh, you know, our, we really firmly believe that the ability to set boundaries is so much rooted in our feeling of, if you cross this boundary, I've got a plan. And if we don't have that plan, it may be challenging to set firm boundaries, you know? Yeah. And the only other, I would say, you know, it, maybe perhaps the reason why that, that's not the case is because somebody has been taught from a young age that their boundaries are, um, are respected yeah, and that they are encouraged to set boundaries. Mm. So I think that's another, you know, there might be some people where setting boundaries comes very natural. And my hope- Who are they? They sound know, awesome. Right? <laughs> that would be amazing. <laughs> but for so many of us from a young age, we, again, we are, we are, our boundaries are basically trampled over. Okay. And, and so this is something now, you know, as parents that we, we think about with our children is like, you know, what boundaries I want them to uphold and what is me just trying to control them? And then what boundaries do I need to keep with them? Right. So this, this idea of, um, you know, just feeling like you, you deserve to set boundaries is a, is a huge part of self-defense. Right? Yeah. And our next biggest tool is energy conservation. Mm. Once the boundary has been crossed and we are now in a place of physical attack, Energy, energy conference conservation is literally the difference between life and death. The, the idea is if someone is going crazy, going hard on you, and you're trying to defend, and you're both energetically dropping at the same rate, there's not a chance of you winning. But if you allow them to expel all the energy as much, and you're defending with the least amount of energy as possible, your likelihood of survival or getting out in a way that with the least amount of harm goes up significantly. Mm -hmm. So it's really important for us to understand that energy conservation is one of like the basic principles of jujitsu that makes it the most survivable, technic technically speaking, self-defense system around. Is that we understand using less energy is to our benefit. Especially when we know that whoever we're gonna be defending ourselves against is gonna be bigger, heavier, and stronger than us. Yes. So it, it only makes sense to say, if we both expend all of our energy and just like oh, fight and go crazy, I'm gonna gas out first, and then yep. this person can take can can take advantage of me or continue on with whatever it is they have planned. So, this concept of energy conservation is a huge one, and again, can be explored more in detail when the actual practice of these techniques, specifically like punch block series, lesson seven, women empowered. Yes, go check it out, GracieUniversity.com. Um, <laughs> but the energy conservation, such and and yeah, and we're gonna get more. It's into a secret. This. It's a goal. It's, we'll get into it's, it. It is. It is. Um, and then, then the next one is just this idea of preemptive self-defense tactics, right? So this, uh, this, this concept that when you see a threat coming, not only do you have to set boundaries and, you know, maybe set verbal boundaries, but you may actually feel a need to act, to, uh, initiate a preemptive self-defense, um, you know, attack or, or something to basically put them on the defense or to p better prepare yourself. And that's another, that's another strategy too. And one that we acknowledge can be helpful, right? And so some of that is preemptive, strategies, right? So maybe it's me, I'm walking to my car and I've already got my key in between my fingers and I'm, you know, and I'm, I'm kind of preemptively preparing myself for a potential threat. Or right? asking a, another coworker, like, hey, can you walk me home? The creepy coworker over there is constantly look, trying to walk next to me when I go back to my car. You see that things can happen regularly mm -hmm. and you find ways to skirt them with knowledge of preemptively defending yourself. Mm -hmm. And then last, of course, is our techniques. Everything that you learn in the Women Empowered Program 2.0 on Grace University is all the techniques that we've done, a lot of um, informational research with law enforcement, understanding the ways that the attacks happen to women. Mm -hmm. And when those techniques were thought about, we said, these are the tools we need. These are the tools that can help us. What are the most common and dangerous threats? Yeah. And let's address those. And those were basically narrowed down to the 20 most common and dangerous threats uh, you know, for regarding women and the, the types of scenarios that women end up in with in self-defense situations. And so these techniques are part of our tools, right? Yeah. They're just a part of our toolbox. And again, we really believe that under that a firm understanding of those techniques helps us embody those other principles we talked about, which just enhances our toolbox altogether, right? But these tools are nothing without a certain mindset. That's right. So now we talked about the tools, we talked about the principles, but what is what is the self-defense mindset? What is the mindset It's needed? just thinking about being self-defended. Right. right, it's just self-defense. I'm gonna Got it. defend myself, yes.
No. No. It's so much <laughs> deeper, you guys. We're going to go deep with this, okay? What is a self-defense mindset? What is it? What is required for you to be able to deploy these tools and principles and techniques? What is required? Think about it, okay? It is the fundamental belief that we are worth defending. What? Hold on. I know. Stop. I know. Stop, stop. The I mean, fundamental belief that we deserve to defend ourselves. To be alive. To have our own body sovereignty. To be able to say no to someone touching us. That belief that you are worth it is the root of whether or not you will defend yourself, learn the techniques, and be prepared for any of these situations. And that sounds mm. simple, right? It sounds very simple, especially since we're still talking about this traditional form of self-defense where we have this idea perhaps in our mind of, you know, somebody who is stalking us in a parking garage and tries to, you know, abduct us, right? Let's just use that example. We all go, of course I'm worth defending. Yep. I would fight, I would fight to stay alive in that. Maybe we've embodied that idea, right? So maybe everyone here says, you know what? I would totally defend myself. I, I believe I'm worth defending against, you know, this creepy guy in the parking lot or the drunk guy in the alley or whatever that might be that we, again, have this kind of idea, um, this kind of superficial idea of what self-defense looks like. And mainly right? because it's, I, I need to stay alive. I want to stay alive. That, mm. that, and that is so primal in all of us. Your body is working every minute of every day to stay alive. So naturally, when your life is being threatened or at risk by some scary thing to come or human, Naturally, like, yep, I'll do whatever it takes to, to fight against them. And that's a good place to start. We okay? like that So we hope point. that you guys are here with us. And if not, that's a question to talk to yourself about and go, wow, I got to work on this. And mm. how do I get to a place where I will, you know, really feel like I can, I can and will defend myself and I deserve that, right? But let's assume we're all on... Can, let's can start here at this Let's baseline. start here, right? So we, let's say that we all say, yes, I, I deserve to defend myself against you know, that guy in the parking lot. I deserve that. I'm going to, I'm going to live. I'm going to survive. Let's go one, a few steps deeper, right? Do we apply that same mindset to other threats against us? Now, what kind of threats are we talking about? Maybe not the physical threats, maybe psychological threats, right? Maybe threats emotional to our health, threats. maybe emotional health threats. So do you have that same conviction about defending yourself against this, this guy in the parking lot? as you do against defending yourself against your abusive coworker mm. or your sister-in-law who has been driving you nuts. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I never do that never with her, that. just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> Not me. <laughs> or your husband, mm. right? Or your children. Oh my goodness. My children run all over me sometimes. Or again, these lifestyle choices, you know, health, your, your, your health. Are you defending yourself and your health? Like these are threats to your livelihood. Your physicality or your, your food. Our, 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 you know, our own dreams and ideas. Do we defend our, our dreams? Do we defend our, our goals in life okay. with that same conviction? The worst one or the best one. Yeah. Do you defend yourself against yourself? Mm. Your mind, the thoughts that you think, the feelings that you're feeling, the, the self-deprecation, the limiting belief systems, the ideas that maybe I, I'm not worth it or I can't do it. Do you practice self-defense against your own self? Mm. And the indoctrinated ideas that maybe were given to you by your parents, that were given to them by their parents, or do we just blame? Or do we just say, oh, well, they did this to me, so it's their fault. We have to own that self-defense roots into every aspect of our life. And if we're going to get serious about the traditional sense of self-defense permeating into everything that we can do, we have to be honest with where we actually have control. And that's almost everywhere in our circle and our bubble. Mm -hmm. So let's talk about how we can now apply those same tools, the same principles of self-defense, but to other areas of life yep. that could potentially be threatening to our livelihood, right? And let's just start from where we, where we did with the self-defense, awareness, right? Are we aware of the unhealthy relationships around us, right? Are we aware that somebody is making us feel unsafe? even though they're supposed to be our, you know, friend or everyone else likes them, or maybe they're, it's somebody you're dating, right? Are we aware of that? And are we willing to kind of like open our eyes to the possibility that there might be threats that we're not feeling really prepared to face yet, 
Yeah. Right. So just having that awareness in life, right? Are you aware of even yourself and, and the thoughts that you're thinking? Are mm. you aware of the, the friends that you happen to hang around with that are perpetuating an idea or a lifestyle that you don't want to be a part of, but you've allowed this friendship to continue past its growth point, past mm -hmm. its okay point, and now you're just allowing that insidious ideal, the uh, insidious ideologies that you don't even want to be a part of your life to continue to come in it. Are you aware that that's even happening? And are we using our intuition, right, on a daily basis? Are we not just, again, in the parking lot, but are we really listening to our intuition about what we feel like is, is right for us or what we feel like is healthy for us or what we feel like is hurtful towards us? Are we yeah. listening to that? Because let me tell you, every time I've had an intuitive thought about somebody doing something wrong to me, guess what? I'm You're always right. right. Always. And that's, that's always the rule I give all my friends. I'm like, if you think something, for example, if you're in a relationship and you think that person is not either being you know, loyal or honest with you, you're 100% right. I, I'm gonna tell you this right now, I don't know who you are, I don't know what relationship you're in, but if you have that intuition, you are right. If the red flag came up, at least look at the are flag, Are we listening you guys? to our intuition though, right? So that's where, again, we just have to get, are we using intuition in every area of our lives? In business, are you going, God, I have this feeling that I wanna do this thing, but uh, be quiet, be quiet intuition. Or are we letting our intuition speak and guide us and lead us and we are allowing ourselves to do that? Mm. Right, distance management. Okay, how are we managing <clears throat> distance safely with the people around us that potentially could, or the people, the things, the ideas yeah. that could potentially mean us mean us harm? And that might mean distancing yourself from family members. That might mean distancing or the television. yourself from the television or technology or things. And I'll tell you where I use distance management with food. Okay, <laughs> that's the only way I want to keep, you know, if I have health goals for myself to, to keep myself healthy, um, I'm on like some kind, sort of a restrictive diet right now regarding, not even a diet, but there's certain types of foods that I can't eat right now for health purposes. Guess what? I don't have those foods in my house. Distance management. I'm preemptively <laughs> right, thinking about this. I don't buy them at the grocery store. I cannot have them in my house. I need distance management because guess what? If those foods are in my my uh, fridge or they're in my cabinet, I'm eating them. Okay, that's how that works. So yeah. this is another form of, you know, how are we applying distance management to help keep us safe or help manage anything that we feel like uh, could potentially harm us, yeah? So another idea about the verbal assertiveness in the other areas of our life is it's very common for normal conversations that because we want to keep the peace, we're not willing to call people out. Mm. So when people get passive aggressive with us, we start to like get a little quieter or we meet their passive aggressiveness with our passive aggressiveness and now we're in this funny passive aggressive battle instead of just saying, hey, I didn't really like the way you said that to me. Mm -hmm. And it could be someone you actually care about. Like I actually remember in college, some girl made this really sexual joke about some of the experiences that were happening in our school and I had to look at her and I say, hey, can you not do that? That makes me uncomfortable. And I didn't like the way that it was personifying women as a whole because of their life experiences in college. And it was uncomfortable for a moment, but I knew I had to be verbally assertive, or guess what? The culture of the female friend group that we were having would have been tarnished by mm -hmm. the idea that she was keep doing this thing that I didn't want to be around. And I, I didn't mind possibly leaving the friend group. I just, I knew I had to say something. Hey, that makes me uncomfortable. Can you not do that around us? But why don't we do that? Why don't mm -hmm. we have verbal assertiveness? Because we're scared that they might say no. But verbal assertiveness is part of your co-creating tool to create a life you actually want to live. Mm. And this may, might mean to someone, hey, you know what? I need you to, to do this thing for me. Can you do it? It's about making requests and being able to ask for things and being willing to be heard no. And this is a tool just like anything else that we often need to practice. So this is one where you go, oh, I have a hard time with this. And I, I, I would say I probably had this for a while too. And I, I remember having like talks where I went like, oh, that was really good practice for me. And I got like nervous and kind of better. And then I did it and I went, wow, I'm getting better at this. Every time I do this, I get better. Yeah. And this is something that regardless of where you feel like you're at in terms of your use of your, your words or finding your voice in terms of asserting what it is you need or want, you can start anywhere and you can continue to practice that and get better at that. And this goes along with boundary setting. Perfect. Right? The segue. next one, right? So again, verbal assertiveness, boundary setting, one, kind of one in the same. Uh, you need one often for the other. But just this idea of being aware of what boundaries are you, what are your boundaries, right? What are you okay with? What are you okay with? What are you not okay with? And sometimes that's the conversation. Even before you assert any verbal assertiveness or have any conversation, you just have to go, you know what? That made me feel weird or uncomfortable. Why did I feel that way? 
and what is it about that and what how can I how can I you know verbally communicate what boundary I need to set with this person yeah. or thing or and again boundaries can be anything it can be boundaries to your technology like I have to tell Henner guess what put your phone down we're not answering emails right now okay <laughs> I need to set boundaries with him about work we have a very unhealthy relationship with work because that's all we do and it's part of our family it's part of our life it's like never ending so <laughs> we need to set boundaries with our work you know lives and that's a part of you know whatever challenge or whatever again potential we're calling them threats but really they they are they can you know somebody work taking over your life can threaten your livelihood it can threaten your health it can threaten your marriage it can threaten so many things so you just have to be aware of those. And this directly affects energy. So energy conservation being a mm. tool is to understand what in my life, you know, use your awareness tool to then determine in your energy conservation, what in my life is draining the heck out of me? Mm. We call these energy vampires. There are people sometimes in your life that you don't know why, but when you're around them, you just feel depleted of all the energy that you have, whether it's because they don't have their life together, they're, they're in conflict, they are constantly negative, but if you start to feel like I am drained by this person, by this job, by this ideology, by this kind of playfulness I have with my friends that feel, makes me feel inappropriate, by anything in your life that drains mm -hmm. you energetically, it is the biggest self-defense switch to go, I'm not gonna allow this anymore. My energy is so important to me that I will stand up for it because I'm worth having beautiful energy and living a beautiful life. Mm, yes, so energy conservation. What areas of your life can you go, you know what? Not I for can't, me. I can't put the energy towards that right now and I need to conserve this because I have long, you know, I have goals and, and you have to think about the long term, right? Yeah. So if we're burning the candle at both ends or if we're getting energy sucked out of us left and right, that will manifest in other ways. So how are we conserving energy in our yeah. everyday life, right? Um, and then again, I, I kind of mentioned these, but just these preemptive strategies where you go, you know what, I know I am prone to this. And this maybe even comes back to, you know, um, some of our, our challenges with ourselves, right? And, and, our, and our, our, our acknowledgement that we are sometimes our own potential worst enemy out there. Yeah. And maybe there's some preemptive strategies that you set up for yourself to defend yourself against yourself, right? And that could be retraining your brain. Um, we've talked about it, uh, not necessarily us, but Evan and he don't talk a lot about these automatic negative thoughts, the ants, mm -hmm. the ants that run through your brain and they just go, 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 go. How can we defend ourselves preemptively? Like, I know I'm gonna go towards the water and I'm gonna be scared that it's too cold and I'm gonna be scared that I'm gonna get wet and not have a towel. And then I, when I come out, it's gonna be windy. So if you mm. already preemptively think about those negative thoughts before they even come into your mind, you can be ready to go, I know all those things, I'm okay with them or I can, I can overcome them and I'm still gonna go into the water. I'm still doing the ocean dive today. That is something that I think has been one of the harder things for me. I get automatic negative thoughts like, like they just rain in my head. So I really have a lot of compassion for people. If you, if, if you follow me, you will see that a lot of my posts are about mental health because I really relate to this idea that these negative thoughts are, first of all, insatiable. They, they want to feed off of everything. They will literally feed off anything they can, but they're also never ending. And all I thought about when, that, when, when someone is coming at you never, da, 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 you have to either put up a shield or get ready, they're coming. Mm -hmm. How can I preemptively, duh, how can duh, I duh, 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 duh. how can I prepare for war with my negative thoughts? And then, and we can talk about it in a future video, you can learn to reprogram to come at it a different way, but preemptive yes. is a very good one well, to think about. Well, that leads right into techniques. Mm -hmm. Okay, so going back to the techniques, right? We talked about it in the self-defense form, but every, I guarantee you, any challenge that you are facing right now, right, yeah. any potential threat against you, there are techniques to manage, to mitigate, to overcome that challenge. Yeah. And the question is, are we seeking the knowledge, right? So with self-defense, obviously we have the physical techniques that back up our ability to do all these other things. But, you know, our, if, you're, if your issue is, um, you know, parenting, if you're a parent who's feeling overwhelmed by your children and they're trampling all over you and you're going, how do I do this? Like, yeah. uh, you know, there are actually techniques. And I know this because Victoria helped me out with a lot of them. And let me tell you, they work. <laughs> it's amazing. <laughs> Just having some some tools and techniques that you you can pull out of your tool belt, whether whatever challenge that is. You know, yeah. if you're a manager and you're like, how do I do this? I'm managing these people, and it's getting really complicated, right? There are techniques to help, you know, manage manage people into for leadership skills. So, what techniques are you investing in to help you face and overcome potential challenges or even any potential threats in your life? I'm glad she brought up the idea of like parenting techniques. Something that was really big for me in my journey of becoming a mother was being faced with 
a few realities of that my mind has the negative thoughts that it does. My infrastructure of humans around me were all younger than me in terms of not parents yet. So they were um, not educated in some of the options of ways of parenting styles that exist. I've always had Victoria's. I'm like, you do it first and tell me all about <laughs> it. Go have kids. Go get married. Go. <laughs> Everything, guys. All the deeds. It's happened this way. And I'm down. I'll take, I'm right in front of her taking the bullets. Boom, boom, boom. You got she the has. seeds. She has. And I'm, I'm still, like, that's why our sisterhood has been built so strong. But when, when understanding this idea of parenting for me and my journey, I realized that I had to really build my own self-defense mindset by honestly failing forward. Mm -hmm. So first, I had to become aware, and I had to be aware of my parenting strategies. And I was like, oh, my goodness. First of all, there's a million styles, but also I didn't like how I was raised. And I know that because I have my own childhood traumas from it. And then I looked at my partner and I looked at him and I said, how did you feel about how you were raised? And we started to bring awareness to the things we'd enjoyed or didn't enjoy and the results that they yielded and the results that we don't want to be kind of in touch with anymore. And what could we do as a union to cultivate a parenting paradigm mm -hmm. that really resonated with us? And that was the tool of awareness. And it's hard because when you're drowning in that newborn stage mm -hmm. or in the, what do you do with this kid? Are they still alive? That's all that matters. Mm -hmm. It's very rare that you'll go, let me bring some awareness to the situation and see if I'm going to create the parenting paradigm I love. You just want to keep the kid alive. Yeah. I get and yourself it. alive. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I was, I was overwhelmed. I had a home birth and everyone advocated against every ideology that I had towards the way I wanted to be pregnant towards the way I wanted to have birth and towards the way I wanted to have kids. And I know why it was different. It's not the traditional route. So that awareness of going, I, I'm willing to step out was big for me, Yeah. which led to my intuitive nature. When my body said, I want to have birth at home, everyone's like, what, why? And I couldn't really explain why I had some understanding, but it was my intuition screaming at me saying, this is where you feel comfortable. This is what feels right. And then of course there's scientific reasonings that I could prove to it, but none were enough to battle everybody else's automatic negative thoughts, fears, and ideologies. It was mm. a tough battle for me for a while to say, no, I want to, I want a mother like this. I want a birth like this. And I want a parent like this intuitively. And when you battle with someone on intuition, that's a hard battle to go in, but I had to lean into that tool. I had to stick to my intuition. And to me, seven years later, it's paid off. Yeah. I think so. And, but that's, that's, it's a challenging thing when you have your intuition and it's not just like, oh, here's my intuition and everyone else is kind of on the same board. But when you have intuition and everyone else is telling you something different, it's really hard to tap into that and to, and you have always been like, so true to that. And that's something I admire very much about you. Yeah. But that also had to lead me into distance, distance management. Mm. I had to keep myself a bit away from some of the people who had tons of projections and reasons why I would fail and that won't work and here's why. And when I sat there, I was like, man, if I stay in this realm, if I stay close to these people perpetually, I'm gonna believe them because not only are they family or friends, I value their thoughts and their life experiences. And even though they've never gone down this route, their words have power with me. And because I knew that, I had to keep a distance. I distanced myself to manage my ability to navigate my own self-defense situation in a time that's already sensitive. Mm -hmm. Being a mother is already tough. Having a newborn is already hard. I didn't need any more of that. That management was so important for me. So important, yeah. And, and again, if you can't, if you feel like this is overwhelming, especially somebody over, you're trying to um, overcome your intuitive desires, then, yeah. then distance management might be. And you might need to use some verbal assertiveness in order to create those, to create those both like, you know, setting boundaries, verbal assertiveness, and then um, to, uh, to enable that distance that might be necessary during that time. And I did. I set a lot of boundaries and I didn't know how to set boundaries. So it was also a beautiful learning curve to go, how can I tell them this? How can I say, and listen, I said it a lot of ugly ways first. And then I said it a little bit like less ugly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I actually found a very profound, graceful, and kind way of saying, hey, this is my life journey as a mother. And I would really appreciate you allowing me to make these mistakes and learn this learn this learning curve on my own. I know it's not the traditional route. And I know that it might not even turn out as I want, but I really want to try this. I really believe in this. Can you support me in that? It took me so long, and I'm talking years, mm -hmm. to find the most beautiful, graceful way to be verbally assertive and set boundaries. It was hard. And you know why it took so long? Because it took you that long to feel confident 
in your in your skill sets and in your you know in your ability in your journey and once you have that confidence again it's so much easier to set clear boundaries um, when, when you don't have confidence, it's like, again, you still don't even know whether you fall back on your tuition or whether you listen to what people are saying. So it's, it's, it's more challenging. And this could go for anybody in a professional setting, in, in your life with, you know, your family members, not even with a birth. If you're not confident to stand up against your own parents mm -hmm. about wanting to become, you know, a dance major instead of an engineering major, of course it will be difficult to set your first boundary. But you gotta start practicing that. That's when the, the, the lifting of the weights happens. Lifting of your weights first, you're sore. You don't build the muscle immediately. This takes time. And as you start to prove to the people around you that not only is this important, it's possible and it's what I'm doing. Love me or leave me. That's mm -hmm. what I wanna say to that. Because it's really important that you stand for what you believe in and that people around you also support you in that. And if they don't, then we start to slowly let people go. That doesn't mean you don't love them or forgive them. You just let them go. Mm -hmm. Beautifully left and right. And I will say that when it came to energy conservation, I think that's where you had the biggest challenge, right? Because <laughs> Victoria is somebody, and not to speak for you, but <laughs> you know, she's somebody who absorbs everyone's energy for good or for bad, right? Yeah. So she's like, anyone walks in the room, she's like, what's wrong? I know it. She can like <laughs> feel the energy, just like she sucks it in. And so for someone who's going through something herself and then absorbing the energy of people around her, she has traditionally, when going through things like this, been extremely energy drained. Yeah. And I think you've had to kind of come up with coping tools to go, I got to conserve energy and I have to know what things are, you know, what energy I need to release. And again, that might come back to distance management. It may come back yeah. to setting boundaries, but recognizing like, I can't, this is, ex this is exhausting for me to yeah. manage not only whatever challenge you have in your life, but also other people potentially pulling from that energy. Yeah. You'll find that the things that you value in life is where you spend the most energy. Relationships are my number one important thing in my life. Without, there's no second to this right now. It's number one and then there's like number 10 after like. Relationships are it. So when it came to giving the energy to all these relationships and talking about it, it that is why it was such an easy siphon for me to go, oh, I'm depleted because it's all that mattered. Mm. It mattered so much. So it's very important that you know whatever you're valuing and whatever you're putting your energy for, that's also what you need to protect. Mm. So if you value your career so deeply and you don't want anything to touch it, it's also important that you value and um, protect the energy, energy conservation you put towards that career. It's mm -hmm. very important. Great point. Yeah. And then, I mean, I think the techniques, right, was the, yeah. kind of the last element to that. And that is where, like, you did have to come up with your, your own strategies and techniques. Yeah. And I read every book under the yeah. sun. When I got pregnant, it was a book a week. Bah, 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 bah. I look up every technique. And what's crazy is you can look up every technique for everything, but they still might not work for you. So it was a big trial and error for sure. a long time. Yeah. And technique acquisition is a practice and it's a lot of work. And then you go, okay, great, I got all these techniques, but will they work? You yeah. know? So then that's putting into practice. And, and the acquisition of techniques is just for your tool belt. The more tools you have, Hopefully, the more easy the journey might be for you, or at least you trial and error. Yeah, That's and now helps. I think this is where we bring it right back around, right, to the self-defense mindset. So remember when we said, okay, we're on board with defending ourselves against some creepy guy in the parking lot. We will do that. Yep. The question is, all of these other ways of implementing self-defense tools and principles, are we willing, do we deserve mm. to implement those in our lives? Quick Quick note, the answer is yes. You do deserve that. <laughs> cheat, right? cheat. Cheat, cheat, yeah. Spoiler <laughs> alert, the answer is yes. You do deserve that. The real question is, do you believe that? Do and will you, you act on it? And will you act on that? And, or will you, you know, allow people to overwhelm, again, your intuition on what you deserve or your beliefs? Or, um, you know, will you find you know, difficulty implementing these strategies? And just like with self-defense, the way we learn these tools, the way we learn these principles, the way we master them is by practice. And so we need to practice these self-defense tools, these self-defense principles, and more importantly, the self-defense mindset, right? With any challenges, any threats in our life, not just the physical threat in front of us. And if you have difficulty implementing any of these things, go slow. Start with one first. Just open to the awareness that is around you. Be honest with yourself. I like to write things down. So I start to say, hey, I'm really unaware of this, but now I'm aware. Now I'm aware of this. And once we get into that, you can dive into your personal connection of intuitive nature with it. 
how do I intuitively connect with this feeling? How does that feel for me? Does that feel good? Does that feel bad? Mm -hmm. And then what can I do about it? What kind of distance can I create with this situation just to walk through it? And then do I need to be verbally assertive? Does it need a boundary? Does it need some energy conservation or a preemptive thinking? Or do I need to look up some techniques to really manage what's happening? And if you follow Women Empowered at GJJ at, on our Instagram page, then you will see soon in the next week or so um, some slides that we'll put up about this very Yeah, topic. about all of these tools that we just talked about. And then you can run a checklist and go, have I implemented these strategies into you know, insert whatever challenge you're facing right now. Have yeah. I implemented these and how can I implement them? And you can start doing kind of your own digging, your own searching. Um, and if you haven't started your physical self-defense journey, that's another one then to, to start. And let me tell you that being able to um, embody these principles, and that's what's so beautiful about physical self-defense is that it's a physical embodiment mm. of them. Meaning it's not just us talking about it and we say, oh yeah, that makes sense. But our body is learning them and it's practicing them and our voice is saying them and it's showing them. So there's something about the physical embodiment yeah. of these that allows you to then just embrace them and then be able to use them for other areas of life, right? And so that's where, again, we just come back to this idea of self-defense, of, of self-defense and, and the techniques tie back to everything because they allow you to embody these principles which allow you to use them in life. Yeah, you can journey from the techniques physically first into other places in your life or vice versa or both. That's a great point because I think, you know, there, there is something to be said about even if you don't feel like you deserve, like you're, you're still struggling with the self-defense mindset of deserving to stand up for yourself and you're having some self-worth issues, by physically practicing these techniques, what are you telling yourself? Every time you trap and roll somebody off of you and you get up, yep. every time you, you know, simulate breaking somebody's arm. You're telling your body, you're telling yourself, I am defending myself, I'm fighting for myself. And so it's actually some in internal messaging that's happening as you're physically practicing these self-defense techniques, which then go, wait, if I just invested into all this, these physical techniques to defend myself against you know, a predator, I need to be using these in all areas of my life. And yes, I deserve yeah. to defend myself against anything. And one of the most anyone. critical steps to building confidence is to feel capable. And mm -hmm. the beauty of the Women Empowered program and the jujitsu techniques that you learn is that in a very short amount of time, you go from not being able to execute this move to feeling incredibly capable to even like mastering a technique in the shortest amount of time that you imagine it could be possible. Like learning a dance move. A couple times of practice, you're like, oh my gosh, I just broke his arm. Yeah. Not literally, we don't yeah. do that in class. We're yes. very gentle. <laughs> but it's important that you know that you can. And that is a seed to the confidence building that we want to help everyone around us, including ourselves, continue to build. Mm. So good. I feel like I could say more, but I wanna like, just let it sit, <sighs> sit in. Let it sit in. I, we could talk about this all day, but this self-defense mindset, where are you applying it in your life? And where are you potentially not, right? Where yeah. do you go, Ooh, I got some work to do. And I, I have some areas I need to work on. I'm yeah. sure you have areas you need to work on. All of us. Right, all of us do. And there's some areas where we might be like, oh, we're nailing self-defense in that area, but over here, we need a little more focus. So yeah. um, we are going to be yeah, posting up all of these tools on our Instagram. Uh, we also wanted to announce that we are uh, creating our own a, a separate YouTube page so that we can create more women empowered content and that you guys will be um, alerted to it. So that if you go back to our Instagram and you can swipe up and you can find the page there. When, we we need a certain number of subscribers to be able to have a page and to go have live. A name. But then we can't. Yeah. So anyways, find us there and uh, we'll be putting out more content, more discussions, more talks, um, more techniques, everything about self defense women empowered and how we can apply it to our everyday lives. Yes. So thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate your time, your heart, mm -hmm. your messaging. We see a lot of the, the writing over here. We have Instagram live going, YouTube live going. We'll go back and, and read all the comments yes. uh, to connect with you guys. And but. we know your time is really valuable and how you choose to send it and give it is really important. So we just want to just express our deep gratitude and we hope that you have a self-defended day. <laughs> Nailed it. <laughs>